And so before we get started, I'd like to uh, give uh, thanks and credit to uh, some men who uh, helped me with this. Uh, for one, uh, Dr. Fred Shea from uh, Phoenix Seminary many years ago, probably 20 years ago, I heard him ta- uh, teach Psalm 15. And uh, I haven't forgotten uh, the one to whom this psalm points. And uh, I was remembering now, I've remembered this the whole time. I've lost you know, details, of course, but uh, I've always remembered that. And then I want to thank Dan Hahn turned me on to a podcast of uh, James Renahan, Dr. James Renahan, uh, who was uh, speaking on how he would preach Psalm 15. And so I was able to, to borrow some from him. But I was really pleased to hear that James Renahan and Fred Shea were both, I mean, in lockstep on their interpretation of this psalm. And so I want to just get that out front. So if you hear things, uh, if you were to listen to those men and you heard the same things, well, that's where I got it. I didn't just come up with this all on my own. So (laughs) uh, I give them much, much, much credit for this. So Psalm 15, a psalm of David. This is the word of God. O Lord, who may abide in your tent and who may dwell on your holy hill He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. He does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, and whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. He does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent." He who does these things will never be shaken. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to your word this morning, understanding that your word is is sufficient for us, sufficient to teach and instruct and prepare us, Lord, uh, to walk in your ways, to equip us for the uh, all of your works that you have for us to do. We know that this word was uh, spoken through men who were born along by your Holy Spirit. And so we ask this morning, since your Holy Spirit is the true author of Scripture, that your Holy Spirit would teach us this morning and open the word to us, Lord, that we may understand and uh, cast away uh, the darkness of deception or uh, anything untrue that we believe about you and, and your word. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So Psalm 15. So we see that the way that this, we let, well, one thing we notice about this psalm, there's only five verses, so it's short and sweet, and we like that, right? <laughs> uh, and it starts out, and it has a certain structure to it where it asks a question, and this is a question that uh, is the, probably the most uh, important question that there is in life, and that is, how can I be right with God? How may I uh, inherit? What should I do to have eternal life? We think of the rich young ruler. What must I do to have eternal life? How can a man be right with God? And this is really the question we see asked in the first verse, and then the following verses are the answer. So that's nice, right? We have a question and then an answer immediately preceding, proceeding, or coming after it. So our question is, and we see it uh, spoken twice here, uh, O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? So it's the same question asked twice, just a little bit differently. So let's look at that. Oh Lord, who may abide in your tent? And abide means what? It means to remain stable or uh, to remain in a state of love, to continue in a place. Uh, there's a continuance. There's a sort of a permanence in abiding uh continuing relationship. Who may abide in your tent? Who may, re- uh, who may remain in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Who may take up residence there? Who may uh, make your holy hill their home? And let's think of what does the tent and the holy hill, what do these things symbolize? These are, this is the presence of God. We're, the question is, who may come into your presence? Who may abide in your tent? And remember, uh, in the wilderness wandering, when God led the children of Israel out of Egypt, uh, they 
uh, he gave them these very elaborate instructions on how to build a tabernacle. And uh, we know that there was the outer wall and then within there was like another tent and there was the, uh, the holy place and that's where there was the, the lampstand and the showbread and the, the uh, bowl of incense and the, the priests went in and out of there and, uh, ministering. But then inside of there, in, within the, the, uh, that holy place, there was an even uh, a veiled portion that was called the Holy of Holies where no one was allowed to enter. And that's where the Ark of the Covenant was at. And the Ark, remember, it was the, the mercy seat and it had the overshadowing, uh, the covering cherubim over it. And this was the place where God manifested His presence. So the Ark, was the, that was God's presence in there. That's where He uh, manifested His presence was in the Holy of Holies. And, um, and then when you see the on His holy hill, remember Jerusalem, when they were in the Promised Land, that's where the Temple was, the Temple Mount, uh, God's holy hill. And um, wherever God is at, that is, that is holy. Remember when Moses approached the burning bush and the Lord called to him and, and told Moses to take off his sandals for he was on holy ground. <laughs> Uh, but so this is God's holy hill is to enter into His presence. Uh, the temple, where it was the same, there was the same land. There was the temple where God manifested His presence in Israel. So this is, uh, so the question is, who may abide in your tent? And if we remember, uh, who, was, who was allowed to go in to the Holy of Holies? There was no one allowed except for the high priest. And he couldn't just go in whenever he wanted he went once a year on the Day of Atonement. And he had to make sure that he brought a, an offering for sin. He brought the, the blood of the sacrifice with him. And he, he had to make atonement first for his own sins and then for the sins of his people. And if you remember, they tied a rope around his ankle uh, and then in case perhaps his offering was not pleasing to the Lord or he was not pleasing... And if he uh, died in the presence of the Lord because of that, um, this way they could get him out of there because no one could go in. No one could enter the Holy of Holies. God's presence. There was the veil between God and everyone else, right? No one was allowed except the high priest. So the question is saying, who shall abide who shall remain? The holy, the whole, so this is speaking of God's unveiled presence. Who may go into the presence of God, into the Holy of Holies, so to speak, into His very presence and remain? Who can abide there? Who could make this His residence, His dwelling? Who can make this His home and live before the face of God? Well, our answer uh, comes right after that. Thank you, Lord, for that, and David. Well, he who walks with integrity and who works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart, he does not slander with his tongue, nor does he do evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised and who honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. He does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. Well, there you go. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I wanted to give you guys a short sermon today. So, uh, <laughs> but there you go. There's your answer. <laughs> no problem. We've done all that since our youth, right? <laughs> Everybody, right? Oh, I've done that. <laughs> uh, all right, well, maybe we should look a little bit closer at that, right? <laughs> who may remain in God's unveiled presence? He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. That, that third sentence there, that third little phrase, really speaks to me on that. He who speaks truth in his heart. So he has pure thoughts. He has pure thoughts. This is a man who uh, meditates upon God's law at all times. He, he's thinking godly thoughts at all times. He speaks truth in his heart. Pure thoughts. Think about that. 
He only meditates on God's Word. His Word abides in this man. God's Word abides in this man. This man walks with integrity. He, wa he has moral excellence. He walks with integrity. He works righteousness. So you could say, I think you could say in verse 2, you could say that this man's life is, is marked by a, a pureness and a moral excellence in both thought, word, and deed. Uh, let's, let's just turn to Matthew right quick. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5. And remember, um, Jesus said a few things about this, I think. All right. When we're talking about thoughts, this is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. Matthew 5, 27. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. His thoughts. Think about that. You know, there's a, there's, um, I don't want to pick on anybody and cause problems, but uh, there's people in, uh, in uh, church nowadays in our country who are saying that, um, you know, it's okay to have sinful thoughts regarding sexuality, and that's okay as long as you don't, as long as you don't act on those. That's all right. That it's not sinful. It's not sin unless you act on it. But is that what Jesus says here? He says, you've heard that it is said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So they may not have actually carried it out, but he said it was in your heart to do so. And that's sin. Verse 27 and 28. Oh, I've already hit that. Uh, oh, 21 and 22. He said, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court and whoever says to his brother you good for nothing shall be guilty before the supreme court and whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell So how's that for... Uh, <laughs> uh, how about those thoughts? Those are sinful thoughts. I mean, if that's enough to get you into... to have you judged and condemned and sent to hell, that's, uh, that is obviously sin. And that's a sin of the heart. That's showing that there's something wrong inside of us. And if we turn to... Uh, let's go to Matthew 15. Matthew 15, 11. And this is where uh, Jesus was in trouble about, uh, I believe it was because his, uh, they were accusing him of that uh, his disciples were not following all the Sabbath traditions that they had. They were not washing their hands and doing all the, the washing before they were eating. And Jesus said uh, in Matthew 15, 11, it's not what enters the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles the man. And if we skip down, he says uh, in verse 17, Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. So he's speaking, there's a there's a heart issue. It begins in our heart. It begins in our mind. But this man he's speaking of, this one who may abide in, in God's tent and dwell on his hill, he's the one that walks with integrity, works righteous. He speaks truth in his heart. You could say that those things are even the fruit of, for one, having a pure uh, heart, pure thoughts. He works righteousness. He walks in integrity. That's like the natural outworking of those things. So let's move on. 
So now we have some negatives. So these are the positive. He does this, and now we get some don'ts. He does not slander with his tongue, nor does he do evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend. So God does not attack people with his tongue, with his words. He does not slander. He does not lie. He does not assassinate their character. He's not uh, gossiping. Uh, he's not malicious. Um, I thought it was interesting that the word devil means slanderer. So when we're slandering somebody, we're acting like the devil. And remember, I think uh, Jesus said something about that. You, he told the Pharisees and the scribes and such, they were acting like their father, the devil, because <laughs> they were lying about him. They were slandering him. So when we slander, we are like the devil. We, so we must speak truth in our hearts. We must speak truthfully. This man speaks truthfully. Have you ever slandered anybody <laughs> with your words? I know I have. It reveals a heart issue. Have you ever done evil to a neighbor? Have you ever taken up a reproach? What does this mean? What do these words mean? What is a reproach? It's a, a strong disapproval. It's, a, it's to point out the faults of somebody. It's to disagree or to discredit someone. It's to kind of bring something up that doesn't need to come to light. It's to, to kind of run someone down in front of others. It's to uh, take up an issue with somebody when there's, there's no need to. He takes up a reproach against his neighbor. Against his friend, actually, is what it says. He takes up a reproach against his friend. So he's backbiting his friends, taking up, running them down, discrediting them, disapproving, talking badly about them. Nor does he do evil to his neighbor. Let's, uh, let's just turn to Proverbs right quick. And I just kind of ran through a few Proverbs earlier. You know, I was, I was kind of looking through the Proverbs. And, you know, there's all kinds of interesting things that you see in Proverbs. It's like we need to... It makes me always realize, gosh, I need to be spending way more time reading Proverbs because I need wisdom. So Proverbs chapter 3, uh, let's just start at verse 29. These are some examples of not doing evil to your neighbor. Do not devise harm against your neighbor while he lives securely beside you. Do not devise harm. So you're sitting here making evil plans against your neighbor who dwells securely. He doesn't realize there's a problem. Your neighbor thinks everything's all good. And here you are plotting evil against him. Maybe you're mad because uh, he won the, the Christmas light uh, contest. And uh, he dethroned you. <laughs> and now you're planning and getting him back. <laughs> Do not devise harm against your neighbor while he lives securely beside you. Do not contend with a man without cause if he has done you no harm. Don't start things up with somebody without a reason. <laughs> you know, uh, If the guy has done you no harm, what's the deal? Do not envy a man of violence. Do not choose any of his ways. For the, and So here we go. For the devious are an abomination to the Lord, but he is intimate with the upright. The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Though he scoffs at scoffers, yet he gives grace to the afflicted. The wise will inherit honor, but fools display dishonor. Um, that kind of goes more with what's coming up in the next verse, but I think you get the idea. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal faithfully are God's delight. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's go back to Psalm 15 again. Our next... So, so this man is good to his neighbor. So I think you could say in verse 2, he's saying, uh, Love God. With all of your heart, mind, and soul, and strength. And verse 3 and 4, he's talking about you know, loving your neighbor. Or verse 3, love your neighbor as well. Verse 4 is kind of interesting, isn't it? In whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. Uh, I, I thought James Renahan brought something up that was interesting. And uh, I love what he said about this. He said, despising someone in whose eyes a reprobate or a vile man is despised. And he thought, wow, that's kind of interesting, despising someone. <laughs> uh, 
despising. He's like, and he was, he was asking, you know, where have we seen that in a list of godly attributes? You know, despising, right? <laughs> and I, I was like, wow, yeah. And, and, you know, if we are looking at this, you know, honestly, looking, you know, taking this word and applying it to ourselves, looking at ourselves, how do we stack up with this? That, that kind of hits a little close to home for us, doesn't it? In whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. Because, uh, I mean, if we are looking at this, we can say, wow, I'm, I'm not sure I really measure up to uh, some of the standards that have already been thrown out there in this verse. Some of these things that have been spoken to us already, I'm not sure I really measure up to that. And so to despise, you know, a sinful man, though uh, the things he may do are wicked and evil, and I'm tempted to despise them and, and hate them or whatever, um, am I really in the place to to properly do that. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's very interesting. In whose eyes a reprobate is decided, but he honors those who fear the Lord. And one of the things he pointed out here was that, but there's a distinction that's being made here. This person who qualifies to dwell on God's holy hill, he's able to make a distinction between good and evil. The evil man and the good man, he distinguishes. It kind of reminds us of of uh, some of the language we find in the New Testament of, you know, God, or, or even in the Old Testament, of God, you know, hating one person and loving another, honoring one person, dishonoring another. Honor, dishonor, this kind of thing. Um, but these are words that are spoken by, by God usually. You don't usually see this from a normal man saying these things. This man swears to his own hurt, and he does not change. So he makes promises and he keeps them no matter what. Even when things go maybe badly, you know, when circumstances change, he does not go back on his word because uh, now to fulfill his word would bring harm to him. Or maybe he just makes great promises that he promises to fulfill regardless of the cost. He swears to his own hurt and he does not change. No circumstance will turn him away. Nothing will change his mind. Verse 5. He does not put out his money at interest. Nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. So this man takes... He does not use what God has blessed him with. The blessings of this life, you know, and wealth and such. These... these um, these blessings he's been given, he does not use to harm others. He doesn't use it to the disadvantage of others. Uh, you know, it was, it was forbidden in Israel to uh, put out money at interest. You know, uh, to put your money out to the poor man, the needy person, to give out money and, and charge them interest. You were not to do that to your brothers. They were forbidden from doing that. They could charge an interest to, I believe, a foreigner, but it was not to be excessive. So it's forbidden to put out money at interest. And honestly, this would be to speak about charging you know, outrageous interest to the poor. And really in the idea is to keep people poor, to keep them in poverty, to keep them in slavery, uh, to, to keep them down, really. And that's what uh, really it's speaking to is, is what's behind that. Nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. And of course, I think we, we can understand the, the evil of that. Uh, of taking a bribe against someone who is innocent, uh, that they may be falsely accused, that they may be condemned for something that they've not done, that justice is perverted uh, by a bribe. It breaks down a society, doesn't it, when justice, when there is no justice, when the judges are corrupt, when the system, the, the government, the laws, the judges, when it's all corrupt, uh, it, it tears apart a society, doesn't it? And this man does not take bribes against the innocent. So he is pure, right? He's looking out for his neighbor. And it says at the end here, it wraps it up here. Here's the last positive. It goes back to a positive again here. He who does these things will never be shaken. Never be shaken. And I underline that word never. This man will never be um, shaken. He will never be uh, cast off. He will never fall away 
from the presence of the Lord, but he will remain, he will abide in God's presence forever. This man will never be shaken. The one who does these things. And so, uh, do we feel more warm and fuzzy about our instructions for how to be right with God? <laughs> uh, I think if we, you know, if we read this honestly, I think we should notice that this is, this is law, isn't it? This is law. And what do we know about the law? What does the law do? I remember Pastor John was talking about this recently. <laughs> what do we know about the law? First, the law reveals God's standard, doesn't it? It reveals a standard. It reveals sin. It reveals our shortcomings. Through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And the law leads us to Christ. And I've kind of let the cat out of the bag a little bit here. So we're looking at this and we may be in despair thinking, I don't live up to any of these standards. This is the law. And the law is given to sinners to show us that we fall short of the glory of God. And so we have to ask ourselves, who is this person? Who is this man who would dwell on God's hill? Who is the one who would abide in God's tent? Who is that person? Who, would, who qualifies for that? And fortunately, in the Psalms, uh, David and God have uh, given us a few hints. We'll just look at a couple of things that will kind of point the way a little bit for us. Uh, let's look at uh, Psalm 11. Or, uh, excuse me, let's look at uh, uh, Psalm 2. Psalm 2. We're familiar with this one. Uh, let's start at verse 7. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And I went too far there. He who sits in the heavens laughs. Verse 4. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. So there's a clue. God has installed His King on His holy mountain. He has installed Him. So that's a permanent uh, appointment there that He's talking about. Let's go to Psalm 24. Psalm 24. This is a messianic psalm here. Psalm 24, the King of glory entering Zion, a psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For He has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? See, now we get the same language again here. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may go up into God's presence? And who may stand and remain, right, in His holy place? Who may stand? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Same kind of language there. Clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors that the King of glory may come in. So this is, a, this is a call from the throne of God, isn't it? Calling to the gates of heaven. Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, He is the King of glory. So He is the one who may enter the gates and approach the throne of God. He is the one. The one whom God has placed on His hill. Alright, so these are some hints. Let's uh, turn also to Matthew Let's 
go to Matthew 15. Ah, that's not the one. All right. I seem to have lost my spot here. Let's go to Matthew 5. Matthew 5. And this will give us a, just another hint or two as to who this person is. I think we already know. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is preaching. And he says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And the scribes and Pharisees were trying to live out Psalm 15, weren't they? They weren't understanding what the law was getting at because this is law and this is pointing out uh, sin and they were not accept they were not realizing that so they were trying to uh, have a righteousness of their own by doing the works of the law and once again what do we know about the law the law reveals uh, sin so let's go to Romans chapter 3 and Jesus is saying I didn't come to do away with the law but to fulfill the law Romans chapter 3. We're all very familiar with this. Paul has made the case that all are unrighteous. And quoting from Psalm 14, Paul says, There are none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside together and have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Right? There is no fear of God before them. And Paul says, now we know, in verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law... No flesh will be justified in His sight. That is, no human being, no person will be justified. No one will be made right by doing the works of the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we don't measure up to any of these standards here in Psalm 15. We haven't in the past, and we're not doing it now, and chances are really good we're probably not going to do it in the future either, right? We don't have the ability to do that. And that's the purpose of this, is to drive us to this, to, to this understanding. By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, good news, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction... For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation, a satisfaction, right, in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate God's righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, He passed over the sins previously committed. All right. So, in Christ, we have justification. And this is through faith, right? Because we've all sinned and fallen short. He gave Himself as a propitiation for our sins. And so when we turn from our sins, when we believe and repent, believing has the idea of repentance built into it. It's like to believe in Christ is to trust in Him with all of your heart. It's to turn away from my way. It's, uh, the proverb, proverb says that there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. 
The end of that way is death. And that's the way we've all been on. Uh, that's the, all, the way we've all been going um, since the beginning of our life. Right? Like, like sheep, we've all gone astray. Each has gone his own way. But, the, uh, but our iniquities were, have fallen on Christ, though. Um, so we turn from Christ, or we turn from ourselves, and we turn to Christ. And um, I lost track of what I was saying there. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so when we repent, we turn from our ways, and we turn to Christ, who said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And we turn and we trust Him, and we trust what He says, and we follow Him. We forsake our old ways. And uh, so when we do that, when we've placed our faith in Christ, what God does is He, what has happened is that our sinfulness has been uh, applied to Him, has been imputed to Christ at the cross. He paid for our sins. He bore our curse. He bore our sins in His body on the cross and died to that, doing, you know, doing away with that body of sin. And uh, in return, God imputes his righteousness to us so that we are counted as having lived the righteous life that He did. From that moment, we, have, we are counted as fully righteous and children of God and have all the rights of, of a, a citizen in heaven. We are counted as having lived Christ's righteousness. And we, therefore, uh, because He is the one who can dwell in God's presence, we can dwell on God's holy hill because we are now united to Christ through faith. When we have believed on Christ, we are united to Him by faith. And because we are united to Him, the Bible says that we are in Him. Because we are in Him, we can dwell on God's holy hill in Him. Where He is, there we shall be also. And I want to read to you something that uh, I know some of you have heard this once or twice. Uh, I think it's extremely edifying. And uh, it's Charles Spurgeon, after all. He was the Prince of Preachers for a reason. And I think he explains this very, very beautifully. I think it's extremely edifying. I, it's a little bit lengthy, but I think you'll really enjoy it. Uh, this is from a sermon that he preached uh, in 1861. And his text was from Jeremiah 23.6. And the name of the sermon was The Lord Our Righteousness. Jeremiah 23.6 says, This is His name whereby He shall be called The Lord Our Righteousness. Man by the fall sustained an infinite loss in the matter of righteousness. He suffered the loss of a righteous nature and then a twofold loss of legal righteousness in the sight of God. Man sinned. He was therefore no longer innocent of transgression. Man did not keep the command. He therefore was guilty of the sin of omission. In that which he committed and in that which he omitted, his original character for uprightness was completely wrecked. Jesus Christ came to undo the mischief of the fall for his people, so far as their sin concerned their breach of the command, He has removed that by His precious blood. His agony and bloody sweat have forever taken away the consequences of sin from believers, seeing that Christ did by His one sacrifice bear the penalty of that sin in His flesh. He, His own self, bore our sins in His own body on the tree. Still, it is not enough for a man to be pardoned. He, of course, is then in the eye of God without sin, but it was required of man that he should actually keep the command. It is not enough that he did not break it or that he is regarded through the blood as though he did not break it. He must keep it. He must continue in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. How is this necessity supplied? Man must have a righteousness, or God cannot accept him. Man must have a perfect obedience, or else God cannot reward him. Should he give heaven to a soul that has not perfectly kept the law? That would be to give the reward where the service is not done. And that, before God, would be an act which might impeach his justice. 
Where then is the right, where then is the righteousness with which the pardoned man shall be completely covered, so that God can regard him as having kept the law and reward him for so doing? Surely, my brethren, none of you are so besotted. <laughs> what does besotted mean? It means to be intellectually stupefied as with liquor. It's to be foolish. Surely, my brethren, none of you are so foolish, besotted, as to think that this righteousness can be wrought out by yourselves. Christ in His life was so righteous that we may say of His life taken as a whole that it is righteousness itself. Christ is the law incarnate. Understand me. He lived out the law of God to the very full. And while you see God's precepts written in fire on Sinai's brow, you see them written in flesh in the person of Christ. He never offended against the commands of the just one. From his eye there never flashed the fire of unhallowed anger. From Jesus' eye, there never flashed the fire of an unholy, wicked anger. On his lip, there never did hang the unjust or licentious word. His heart was never stirred by the breath of sin or the taint of iniquity. In the secret of his reigns, what are his reigns? That is the, the, that is the seat of all feelings and affections. That's our heart. In the secret of His reigns, no fault was hidden. In His understanding was no defect. In His judgment, no error. In His miracles, there was no ostentation. That is, there was no pretentious display meant to impress others. In His miracles, there was no ostentation. In Him, there was indeed no guile. His powers, being ruled by His understanding, all of them acted and co-acted to perfection's very self, so that never was there any flaw of omission or stain of commission. The law consists in this first, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. He did so. It was His meat and His drink to do the will of Him that sent Him. Never man spent himself as He did, Hunger and thirst and nakedness were nothing to him, nor death itself, if he might so be baptized with the baptism wherewith he must be baptized and drink the cup that his father had set before him. The law consists also in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. In all he did and in all he suffered, he more than fulfilled the precept, for he saved others, Himself he could not save. He exhausted the utmost resources of love in the deep devotion and self-sacrifice of loving. He loved man better than his own life. He would sooner be spit upon than that man should be cast into the flames of hell and sooner yield up the ghost in agonies that cannot be described than that the souls his father gave him should be cast away. He carried out the law then, I say, to the very letter. He spelled out its mystic syllables, and verily he magnified it and made it honorable. He loved the Lord his God with all his heart, soul, and mind, and he loved his neighbors as himself. The day is coming when men shall acknowledge him to be Jehovah, and when looking upon all his life while he was incarnate here, they shall be compelled to say that his life was righteousness itself. The pith, that is the vital, the essential part of anything, the pith, however, of the title lies in the little word, our. Jehovah, our righteousness. This is the grappling iron with which we get a hold on him. This is the anchor which dives into the bottom of this great deep of his immaculate righteousness. This is the sacred rivet by which our souls are joined to him. This is the blessed hand with which our soul toucheth him, and he becometh to us all in all. Jehovah, our righteousness. 
you will now observe that there is a most precious doctrine unfolded in this title of our Lord and Savior. I think we may take it thus. When we believe in Christ by faith, we receive our justification. As the merit of His blood takes away our sin, so the merit of His obedience is imputed to us for righteousness. We are considered, as soon as we believe, as though the works of Christ were our works. God looks upon us as though that perfect obedience, of which I have just now spoken, had been performed by ourselves. God considers us as though we were Christ. He looks upon us as though His life had been our life. And He accepts and blesses and rewards us as though all that He did had been done by us, His believing people. I know that Socinius in his day... Now, who is Socinius? Faustus Socinius. An Italian theologian who denied the doctrine of the Trinity, he denied the deity of Christ, making him a mere man, and he denied the deity and the personality of the Holy Spirit as well as numerous other biblical doctrines, such as the doctrine of imputed righteousness. I know that Socinius in his day used to call this an execrable, detestable, and licentious doctrine. Probably it was because he was an execrable, detestable, and licentious man. Many men use their own names when they are applying names to other persons. They are so well acquainted with their own character and so suspicious of themselves that they think it best before another can express the suspicion to attach the very same accusation to someone else. Now we hold, you know, that this doctrine is not execrable, but most delightful. That it is not abominable, but it is godlike, that it is not licentious, but holy. Imputation, so far from being an exceptional case with regard to the righteousness of Christ, lies at the very bottom of the entire teaching of Scripture. How did we fall, my brethren? We fell by the imputation of Adam's sin to us. You say that you never agreed to the imputation. Nay, but I would not have you say thus. For as by representation we fell, it is by the representative system that we rise. The angels fell personally and individually, and they never rise. But we fell in another, and we have therefore the power given by divine grace to rise in another. The root of the fall is found in the federal relationship of Adam to his seed. Thus we fell by imputation. Is it any wonder that we should rise by imputation? Deny this doctrine, and I ask you, how are men pardoned at all? Are they not pardoned because satisfaction has been offered for sin by Christ? Very well then, but that satisfaction must be imputed to them, or else how is God just in giving to them the results of the death of another unless that death of the other be first of all imputed to them? When we say that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to all believing souls, we do not hold forth an exceptional theory, but we expound a grand truth which is so consistent with the theory of the fall and the plan of pardon that it must be maintained in order to make the gospel clear. I must give up justification by faith if I give up imputed righteousness. True justification by faith is the surface soil. But then, imputed righteousness is the granite rock that lies underneath it. And if you dig down through the great truth of a sinner's being justified by faith in Christ, you must, as I believe, inevitably come to the doctrine of the imputed righteousness of Christ as the basis and foundation on which that simple doctrine rests. And now, let us stop a moment and think over this whole title. The Lord, our righteousness. Brethren, the lawgiver has himself obeyed the law. Do you not think that his obedience will be sufficient? Jehovah himself has become a man so that he may do man's work. Do you think that he has done it imperfectly? Jehovah? He who girds the angels that excel in strength? 
has taken upon him the form of a servant that he may become obedient. Do you think that his service will be incomplete? Let the fact that the Savior is Jehovah strengthen your confidence. Be ye bold. Be ye very courageous. Face heaven, earth, and hell with the challenge of the Apostle. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Look back upon your past sins. Look upon your present infirmities and all your future errors. And while ye weep the tears of repentance, let no fear of damnation pale your cheek. You stand before God today robed in your Savior's garments with His spotless vestments on, holy as the Holy One. Not Adam when he walked in Eden's bowers. A bower is a covered place in a garden made with boughs of trees twined together. You stand before God today robed in your Savior's garments with His spotless vestments on, holy as the Holy One. Not Adam, when he walked in Eden's bowers, was more accepted than you are. Not more pleasing to the eye of the all-judging, the sin-hating God than you are if clothed in Jesus' righteousness and sprinkled with His blood. You have a better righteousness than Adam had. He had a human righteousness your garments are divine. He had a robe complete, it is true, but the earth had woven it. You have a garment as complete, but heaven has made it for you to wear. Go up and down in the strength of this great truth and boast exceedingly and glory in your God. And let this be on the top and summit of your heart and soul. Jehovah, the Lord, our righteousness. He is our righteousness. Amen. And so Psalm 15 becomes a psalm of gospel, doesn't it? It is law and gospel. For we see here that it points to our Lord Jesus. He is the one who stands on God's holy hill. And we, through faith in Him, are in Him. We are united to Christ by faith and we can stand with Him on His hill. Not in a righteousness of our own, but His righteousness covers us. We have His righteousness given to us as a gift through faith. And so we may abide on that hill because He has fulfilled all the requirements in the law for us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we've had good news preached to us today. We have seen your righteous requirements. We have seen how we fall short. And we have seen how you have covered our need. You have given us a great Savior who has done what we could never do. He gave his life for us. He lived his life for us. And he gave it for us that we might be spotless and holy that we might dwell with Him forever in Your presence, Father. We are so grateful for this great love that You have shown us in Your Son. And so if there's anyone here today who may feel like, I'm not sure that I am in Christ, the good news, Father, is You've given in Your Word is that You have said that today, today if you hear His voice, not to harden our hearts, not to turn away, but we are to seek the Lord while He may be found. We are to pursue Him while He is near. It says, let the evil man forsake his way. May he repent and return to the Lord, for you will graciously pardon us. You will freely forgive us, Lord. And so our prayer is that uh, this word would result in life, and may this revive our souls, Lord. Maybe we have been distant from you. And we ask that you would use this word today to change us, to revive us, to draw us near to you, Lord, and enjoy your presence. We ask this in Christ's name.